Though the arrows fly by day I am yours, you know my name No fear ain't got a hold on me I am not afraid Got to buy a shield of faith I won't fall, cause you're my strength No fear ain't got a hold on me I'm not afraid I'm not afraid I'm not afraid No fear ain't got a hold on me Hey guys, it's Kelsey Skoke, and I could not be more excited to be a part of the Be Not Afraid conference series. Now, when I was thinking about what I wanted to share with you all today, I knew it had to be the Annunciation. Stacey did a great job kicking off the conference and sharing about how we can relinquish control to God. And she used Mary's fiat as an example of how to have such divine trust and, and giving over everything to making such a big yes to him. But I want us to dive even further into Mary's fiat today. I mean, the feast day of the Annunciation is one of the biggest in the year. I would argue that this feast day should even be bigger than Christmas. Now, don't get me wrong, I know that's a little crazy, and liturgically, Christmas is, is a big deal. But if we're pro-life, then that means that we believe that life starts at conception. And that means the incarnation, right? God becoming man happens at the Annunciation. Through Mary's yes, God is able to become flesh for us in the world. And as we're, you know, in the middle of Lent, we get to have an opportunity to maybe push aside some of our, our fasts and, and indulge a little in some of the celebratory things that we'll get to fully do on Easter. Because on this day, we celebrate that God became man, the conception, the, the newness of life happened through Mary's yes. And leading up to Easter, the idea of, of Jesus' passion and resurrection is only made possible through this yes and through this gift of self that Mary gives in her fiat. So what I want to do today is not only look at Mary's fiat, but I want to talk about how can we live out our own fiats every single day? You know, God gives each and every one of us an example, an opportunity to, to say yes to him, whether it's as big as what Mary was asked, or maybe in a smaller way, and a daily yes, a daily fiat he's, he's inviting us into. So I really want us to focus today on three ways that we can use Mary as an example, that we can emulate her fiat in our own daily lives, so we can continue that walk and that, that relationship with Jesus Christ the way that she did. So in order for us to go further into that, let's start off by going back to the original fiat. So in order to do this, if you have your Bibles near you, go ahead and open them up to the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. If not, I'm going to read it out so you can just listen along. But we're going to read through verses 26 through 38 because I think this entire story has just so much meat for us to, to, to digest here. All right, so Gospel of Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this, at what was said, and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I have no relations with a man? And the angel said to her in reply, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who is to be called barren. For nothing is impossible for God. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Now, you may have heard this story before, whether through Catholic school or um, through mass over the years, but there is so much to this beautiful story. Not only the angel appearing to Mary, but Mary's response to the angel and to this request made of her. Now, you might be thinking, okay, Kelsey, yes, I've heard the story and, and I know what goes down, 
But Mary is perfect. I mean, she's literally sinless. So how can I relate to her? How can I even think to emulate Mary in, in her perfection when I'm a sinner? And, and, and saying yes to something that big, big or small, is, is not as easy as she can make it seem. And while yes, Mary is perfect, and, and this is such a beautiful proclamation of her relationship with God, I think there are ways of Mary's humanity that comes through in this passage. You know, Mary has fears and she has some insecurities in knowing what this could look like for her. Um, you know, Stacy mentioned how the scandal that was, would have been created from her saying yes to something like this was not small. And so while she is sinless, there are ways that we can look at this as a human response as well. So like I said, there's three ways for us to live out this fiat every day. And the first is her immediacy, that we, in order to live our fiat, need to respond to God with an immediate response. And now, what does that mean for us? If you look, look at the story, yes, she might have asked a question prior to saying yes, but she doesn't take weeks or months to mull over this decision. She's not thinking about it and wondering what's gonna be the pros and cons and, and weigh those options. Once she knows that God has given her this command and this request, she responds and she says yes. And this is how we should respond to him in our daily lives. And now that's not to say that discernment can't take place. Discernment is when you're trying to discern what God's telling you, what God is really asking of you. And that does take time. That takes prayer and, and counsel from a spiritual director and, and, and different opportunities to think. But the moment that you do know God is asking something of you, the moment you feel and, and hear his voice in your heart and in your prayer, that's when it calls for a response. And, and I give this a story, you know, he asks us many times for various things, big and small. About a year ago, I was on a flight uh, and, and on this particular flight, I had a woman sitting next to me and she just seemed very distraught. She, she was very sad and she was crying for the majority of the flight. And of course, very quickly, the first thing I feel come upon me is, Kelsey, ask her what's wrong. You should help this woman. So I, I, I turned to her and I go, ma'am, are, are you all right? Is everything okay? And within a few words, it comes, it comes to me that I realize we don't speak the same language. So I apologize and, and, and she kind of goes back to crying and, and I sit there and I think, okay, well, you know, I, I did what I could. I asked if there was anything I could do. It's very clear she doesn't speak English. I don't speak her language. So I sat back and, you know, probably did what I normally would have done, reading or messing around on my phone. But all of a sudden, the prompting continued, right? I'm hearing the Lord just prompt me and he says, Kelsey, I want you to pray with this woman. And of course I'm like, okay, God, cool. Um, how the heck am I supposed to do that? How am I supposed to pray with this woman when she doesn't even understand what I'm saying? Um, what if she has a bad experience with the church, right? Like me bringing prayer into this, or even if she did understand what I was saying, what if it adds insult to injury? It causes a bigger issue for her. Yeah, okay, I'll just pray quietly to myself, right? So I'm sitting on the flight and I start praying for this woman who's clearly upset throughout the rest of it. But Jesus is continually asking me, Kelsey, pray with her. I want you to pray with her. So I look down and I see my rosary is in my backpack and I decide, okay, you know, the intercom comes on, we're in our final descent. It's, it's now or never. So I, I grab the rosary and I turn to her and I'm like, are you Catholic? Can I, can I pray the rosary with you? And immediately she reaches out her hand and she grabs my hand. And I start praying the rosary out loud for her. Now, I don't know if she was Catholic or, or if she knew the significance of that moment spiritually, but that's not all she needed in that moment. What she was looking for was comfort and, and, and someone to be there with her for connection and community. And, and by offering that moment, she was given some consolation. And at the end of that flight, I gave her a big hug and I gave her the rosary to keep. And she just, you could tell, had such a Thanksgiving heart for that moment. And now I wonder, you know, that flight was about a two hour flight. Had I not done that sooner, I wish I, wish I could go back and I could have responded more immediately to God and said, yes, okay. And, and saved her from maybe those two hours of, of isolation and, and feeling completely sad and feeling like she was alone. And so that's what God is asking for us. He's asking for an immediate response because we don't know what he could make possible. We, we don't have all the answers. I know we think logically, but he doesn't need to apply to all of that logic. 
If you ever saw someone sitting alone in a cafeteria, maybe that person is sitting there thinking, God, please send someone to, to be with me. I, I feel so alone. Send someone. And I like to think of The Incredibles when you have that little beacon on in, in, on your superhero outfit. Like what if God is just sending out his beacon to any of his followers, any any Christian who, who prays to him and he's saying, go talk to this person. And you have all of these people who are saying, oh, that would be uncomfortable. That, that might be a little awkward. No, thanks God. Or maybe tomorrow, like if, she, if she's still sitting alone tomorrow, I'll do it. When Jesus is asking for us to give an immediate response. So that's the first thing, to follow Mary's fiat, we need to respond immediately. Now, the second response is we need to respond without having all the answers. Like I explained in that, that last story, like we don't speak the same language. What if she, she doesn't understand what I'm saying? What if she doesn't you know, accept what I'm saying to her, right? Those are the questions I have. We don't need to have all of the answers. Now, an example of how Mary is so human, it's probably my favorite thing that she says in this response. When, when the request is first made of Mary, as we remember, her initial question was, how is this possible? Like, how, how can this physically be possible if I don't have a relationship with a man? Um, she's thinking logically. She's thinking with reason and her rationality and thinking, how, how can this even go down? And the response that's given to her is essentially, the Lord will be with you. The Holy Spirit will be with you. Nothing else matters. And and it's not like she has a roadmap of what's about to go down, right? Like, it's not like the angel Gabriel sits down with her after she says yes. And is like, oh, great, Mary. Now that you said yes, let me, let me give you the play-by-play -play so you know what's coming, okay? So because you've said yes, again, this is going to cause a lot of scandal. And so much so that, that Joseph's going to decide he wants to divorce you quietly, but it's still going to suck. Um, but don't worry. In a couple days, I'm going to appear to him in a dream. And so he won't end up divorcing you. So you don't need to worry about that. It'll be okay. Um, and then when you're traveling for the census, while you're nine months pregnant and on a camel, probably very uncomfortable, um, you're going to go into spontaneous labor. And in the midst of this, all of the inns are going to be either filled or because of your scandal, they're not going to let you in. So you're going to have to give birth in a barn around all these smelly animals and be very nervous and uncomfortable and not know if you're going to make it. But that's okay too, because in 2000 years, people are going to have little manger scenes in their home. They're going to sing great songs about it. And so it'll be really a beautiful time for them. So don't worry, it's going to work out great. But then after you give birth, you're going to get word that King Herod wants to kill your child. So you and Joseph are going to have to flee to Egypt, not knowing if you'll ever be able to come home to see your friends or family ever again, feeling completely alone in this situation. But don't worry, a couple years after that, I'll allow King Herod to not be an issue anymore. You'll be able to come home, be able to raise Jesus with your friends and family. It'll be all good. And then after all of that, after 33 years of falling madly in love with your son, feeling like you can't possibly love your son any more than you already do, you're going to have to witness to one of the most brutal murders and, and, and terrible crucifixions you could ever imagine. But don't worry, because in three days after that, I'm going to raise him from the dead. And so you'll be able to be united with him for now and the rest of eternity. So it'll be okay. Right? Mary gets none of that. Mary gets none of the, the, the situations that are going to happen once she says yes. She has no answers. A lot of times we think, okay, Mary's perfect. She's sinless. Of course she says yes. But you don't see all the different times where she continually has to say yes. She continually has to not know that it's going to turn out okay. She doesn't know. And so for us, if there's ever a decision, a question that we're being asked, you know, okay, if I go sit with that person in the cafeteria, am I going to lose all my friends too? You know, if I stop drinking or, or doing some of these things that I have been doing in the past, is it going to be okay? Am I still going to have friends? Am I still going to be okay with who I am? You know, whatever the Lord might be asking of you, if I'm going to live a chaste relationship, will the person still love me that I'm with? Will they accept that? You know, what, what's to come there? There could be so many things the Lord is asking of you. And there might be a lot of questions that go into that. And so to look and as Mary as an example, that on the Annunciation, we can remember that we might not have all the answers, but to follow her example, we respond with immediacy and we have to respond without all the answers. And how beautiful of an example Mary can give to us. Now, lastly, the last way we can live out our fiat 
is to respond in such a way that also brings Jesus to the world. So again, Mary responds immediately. She responds with all the, without all the answers. But her response, her fiat, helped bring Jesus to the world. I like to think of Mary as the greatest evangelist of all time, right? Because she literally brings Jesus to the world. None of us can say that we ever did that physically in the way that Mary did. But she's an evangelist. So what do, what do I mean by that? If we're living out our fiat, if we're living out our yes, how can we also use our yes to bring Jesus to the world? So for some of us, if you're figuring out what you want to do with your life, your career path, and maybe you've been already in a career for 10, 15, 30 years, and you feel this prompting in your heart to make a change, whatever God tells you to do, let's say it's uh, to be a surgeon, right? How are you going to allow that call, that yes that you give, bring Jesus to the world? What are you going to do within that yes that helps bring him, right? Is it you're going to evangelize your coworkers? Or maybe it's you're going to use that job and, and silently be praying for all of your patients day in and day out. Um, maybe it's to comfort those who, who might need a prayer or a or helping hand, even if, if it might be taboo in your line of work. And I'm talking about all things. I'm using surgeon as an example, but maybe you're a teacher and you feel called to uh, serve as a teacher at an underprivileged school district. How can you, uh, and I know there's rules, right? You can't stick an Our Father on the wall always. But how can you use your faith and how can you use your relationship with Jesus to bring him to others in whatever avenue he's calling you to? If he's calling you to leave your place of work and, and to come work for the church, a very noble thing, um, there's a very clear way that you can bring Jesus to others through that yes. But there are many other ways that he might be inviting you. How can you share your kindness and your love for others and your generosity and your forgiveness and, and use that yes as a way to bring Jesus to others, right? Like this, this can be applied in so many ways. For me, I know um, choosing to say yes to God meant giving up a career that I, I had been working for in my life, right? Like I was a business major at a university and I loved it so much. I loved the business world. I did a couple internships in Fortune 500 companies and I would have said it was my dream job. Like I was on the path for him. And for me, when I was living out that, I tried to share Jesus with as many people as I could, right? My coworkers, um, my roommates, different people like that. But what I found for me was there was always something in the back of my mind that felt like I was a little too late, right? Like these people had already made decisions on their career and they were, they were focused on whether it was the financial gain that they would get, whatever it could be. And I thought, what if I got them a little sooner? What if I got them when they were in college and they were making these career decisions, their, their decisions of who their future spouse was, and they used faith to, to make those decisions. But in order to use faith, they need to encounter someone who can introduce them to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And at the time I had known about an organization called Focus and, and I'd known about missionaries. And so for me, what I felt the Lord was, was really driving my decisions and my actions for was to, to become a missionary. And so I decided to give up the career I, I had planned. My family thought I was crazy um, to go fundraise my salary and to, to, to live a life that was very countercultural. But for me, that was a, that was a yes that, that God was asking of me. It was a yes that I needed to give an immediate response. I couldn't just say, okay, okay, God, maybe in a few years, right? I, I had to do it immediately. I didn't have all the answer of how I was going to be funded, how, how would my career turn out, and all of these things. And it was something that I knew I could bring Jesus to. I could bring uh, more people to him and my relationship with him through that yes. And so through that, I could live out Mary's fiat from the Annunciation. And so um, for all of you watching and, and who are experiencing this conference here and hearing what the speakers have to share, I encourage you to pray through what, what is some way you can live out your fiat today during these days, whether it's through quarantine and, and, and maybe it's something small, or once this quarantine is over, maybe there's something bigger God has been asking for you to, to start a podcast or to, to uh, become a missionary or to choose a career that maybe isn't normal or what your parents are thinking you're going to choose. After this quarantine, what 
how can you say yes? How can you use Mary's example and this beautiful feast day of the Annunciation to live your fiat every single day? You guys are in my prayers. Thank you so much for listening. Um, just God bless you during this time.